morning. Spilling the tea this morning. JLR Investigates. Come on in. Reporting from New Mexico. Come on in. Sebastian Rogers is still missing, folks. And I've been talking to lots of people about this case. Getting some insight around the stepfather. About the stepfather. About Katie Proudfoot. Christopher Proudfoot. Come on in. We're going to talk. Because... We're going to talk about alibis. We're going to talk about discrepancies. We we're, going to, we're going to talk about where was Christopher Proudfoot, the stepdad, into the night, the 25th into the 26th. Where was he for sure? Interesting. Come on in. Get yourself a cup of tea. Get yourself a cup of coffee. We are bright and early. It is uh, just after 7.30 a.m. here, mountain time. I am in the mountains. And I can say that investigators have been speaking to people investigators in tennessee have been speaking to people in new mexico about the sebastian rogers case people that know christopher and they want to know a little bit about christopher and his treatment of children i can say that i can say that but we're not going to reveal names of people involved with cases here in New Mexico. Christopher Proudfoot is involved with a serious case in, in New Mexico. Uh, there is a lot of allegations against Christopher. Uh, mistreatment of uh, children, uh, his uh, ABUSE. Uh, it's just, it's bad, folks. It's very bad. And it, it was so bad, folks, that it drew Katie Proudfoot into the mix because she's been filing affidavits in the case. Um, but it's this is this is interesting, folks, to stay, say the least. But uh, I wanted to talk about, as some of you might or might not know, the the surveillance footage that uh, uh, Nick Barris, uh, a, a reporter, was able to obtain in back of the uh, home, from the back of the home of uh, the Proudfoots, uh, Stafford. They live on Stafford in Hendersonville, Tennessee. They're, you know, looking, you know, seeing some flashlights, one flick on, one flick off and whatnot. And uh, that's good that that's out because it does paint a picture in about a timeline here. A little after 3 a.m. But there's lots of rumors being spread. And thus far, I haven't seen the stepfather or mother speak since they last spoke on uh, camera where they didn't show their faces. Uh, haven't seen them search. They didn't go out to the vigil. Um, also told by a reliable source, folks, that Christopher Proudfoot he worked as a, a crane operator in Memphis. His employer told him not to return to work until this is all sorted out. Until this is all sorted out. And that's kind of interesting when an employer basically is letting a employee go and saying, eh, I don't think you should come back here until this is uh, all sorted out. Why is that? Well, my sources have told me investigators are uh, at or went to the job site where Christopher worked at to talk to employees, to talk to the employer, to try to get surveillance footage. Because the alibi, if Christopher has one who claims he was in Memphis, out of town in Memphis, is sketchy to me. It's sketchy most likely to law enforcement. It's probably sketchy to a lot of you. We want to find this young boy, right? Uh, this is interesting right here, and I want to share this because uh, someone, Christopher Proudfoot, responded to someone on Facebook in reference to where he was at. And I want to share this. I want to share this right here. And it says, Christopher, were you in Memphis all week until Katie called saying he was missing or did you go back and forth? This is Christopher's response. I cannot give the details of the dates but I can say that I was away from the house for a while and returned home as soon as I could from Memphis. Why can't you give details of the case? What is so secret about Christopher revealing where he was at and how he went back and forth? What is the problem here? Why can't he give details? Why can't he? Let law enforcement told him not to. No, you would think you were shared to the public and the world and everybody where you were at at all times. And any information that can help this young boy. But it's like the secrecy now is starting to, you know, it's, they're tightening. Trust me, they're tightening. They're actually searching a river uh, 
they were searching a river in between the job of where Christopher worked in Memphis all the way out uh, to Hendersonville in between. I think there was a place to get gas. Stepdad. Yeah, no, stepdad. We're talking about Christopher Proudfoot, the stepdad. But uh, Nick Barris, he put out some information on this. And I want to just re-say re what he put out there because he got he got this footage. And I'm sure you guys seen the lights, right? You seen the lights flickering. Uh, you know, I think this is big. I think this is part of the case. And, you know, maybe Katie Proudfoot was right when, uh, when um, Sebastian left the house barefooted with a flashlight. But I don't think Sebastian left the house alive, barefoot, and with a flashlight. I think he was taken out of the house barefoot with people using flashlights. How about that? How about that? Because it's interesting about the neighborhood, the neighborhood layout. And this is in back of the house. This is in back of the house. And Nick says, exclusive home security footage from the night Sebastian disappeared. A key part of the search for Sebastian is reviewing home security video from the Hendersonville, Tennessee neighborhood. Police are looking for any sign of activity. I've obtained exclusive video and I've confirmed is now part of the investigative file. And it appears to show two people near Sebastian's home the night the 15-year-old disappeared more than two weeks ago. The video is from early Monday morning, February 26, a few hours before Katie uh, reported him missing. There is no timestamp on the copy I obtained, but I'm told the video is around 3.30 a.m. And the video is authentic. Unfortunately, there's not much to see in the pitch black other than two specks of light moving in the area near Sebastian Rogers' home. It is believed Sebastian left the home barefoot with the last flashlight, likely between midnight and 6 a.m. The video is significant because it shows activity around Sebastian's home the night he vanished. This is very brief. Video clip appears to show two individuals with lights walking, and it may be a common area be behind homes. I've highlighted the two lightest sources in the middle of the circles. One light suddenly goes out or is obscured. How about this? How about that? Maybe it's possible that the two lights were Katie and Christopher. And one of them said, don't, 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 turn the light off. Turn. Ah! My phone fell. My phone fell. We're getting so animated, our phone, our phones fall on JLR Investigates. Maybe one of them was so like, turn the light off, turn the light off. We can't, we can't have anyone see. We can't have anyone see. Right? Oops, I know my phone fell. But it is interesting. It is interesting. Uh, and you know, my my thing is, and my and, I, and I'm going to tell you like, like I want to know, I want to know for sure about this phone conversation that Christopher and Katie had. The night before. I want to know how long that phone conversation went. Then I'm wondering, I'm just wondering, JLR investigates wondering is at the time of the phone conversation, was Christopher really in Memphis? Because I heard he doesn't sleep in hotels. I heard he attaches an RV to the truck and he sleep when he does these jobs at these job sites, he stays in an RV. So in reality, how are you going to really have an alibi? How can someone prove that you were there at a location when you weren't checking in a hotel and if you're at a construction site with less security? But what if, what if, what if Christopher, after whatever transpired on this phone call, zoomed home? And what if Christopher say, hey, I'm going to leave my phone here in, in, in Memphis and zoom home. And then once I arrive home, maybe park a block or two behind the house in this, you know, behind the house, behind the house is a house. And then behind that house is a giant construction open site, right? Maybe parked there. And this is my speculation because I believe Christopher's a suspect. That's my opinion. I say it in good faith. I say it as my belief that Christopher, there's a lot of red flags with Christopher about his prior mar marriages, his behaviors, the way he gave interviews. I personally think Christopher's a suspect. So don't at me in a sense with my opinion until authorities arrest someone and they will arrest somebody I, you know if they if it's somebody else it's somebody else and i'll say hey chris wasn't the guy but guess what there's a lot of red flags about christopher and i've read the court documents of the stuff he's accused of doing i don't think he's a good guy i don't think christopher's a good guy that's my opinion and i'm entitled to my opinion you're entitled to yours but i personally think christopher came home in the middle of the night i think he got home in the middle of the night and i think he parked probably a, a, a block or two in that area and then went into the house and whatever happened to Sebastian, they uh, went through the backyard. They went through the backyard, 
flashlights and loaded Sebastian into a vehicle and then took in Sebastian back towards Memphis. So he can get back to the job site by the morning so Katie can make that call and say, hey, Sebastian is missing. And then concoct, you know what I mean, this whole plot that he walked off. I really think this, I think that kind of scenario happened. I don't think Katie, you know, Katie's the last person with Sebastian. And I think she's heavily involved with this whole situation herself. Her body language, and I wish I was a body language expert, and I think I should go to school for body language to try to get an understanding because I've seen serious guilt. And I've seen serious, like, she already knows the outcome in her mind and her body language. Like, this isn't a sense of urgency, like, where's my child, where's my child? She knows, and she's just reflecting on the memories of of of. Sebastian, his likes and his dislikes and what, you know, his smile and stuff like that. But in a sense, she's not acting like a mother that wants to find her child. She's not out there right now. I don't see her anywhere handing out flyers. I don't see her anywhere going on news networks and all the news networks. Do you? Do you? Do you? No, I don't see it at all. But here's the thing that I've was told. I was told investigators because Christopher's involved with a big case out of New Mexico. And I'm, I'm told that investigators talk to the people involved with this case. And they want to get some insight about how Christopher treated children. Because I think that does have a big uh, role in this case. Um, because it could prove a motive here. Because if something bad happened to Sebastian, I think that's what authorities are leaning at, right? They really suspect foul play. They really suspect an, a bad actor or bad actors involved with this case. And the problem, you know, the, the likelihood of a stranger going to Sebastian's house in the middle of the night and luring him out of the home is probably slim to none. I've even heard the theory that, oh, maybe Sebastian was on the Internet and someone catfished him and, 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 and he went out and met somebody up. No, that didn't happen. It's the people the closest. It's the people closest. What's for breakfast today? Coffee. I don't have breakfast this morning. I don't have breakfast this morning, but we're laying out um, breakfast for this case. We're serving breakfast on the Sebastian Rogers case and bringing public awareness. Now, I want to show you something. I want to show you Stafford Court because I'm going to show you just like what we were showing, like right there. See that dot? Well, you see this, all this area, this, this construction area. Well, the dot is in back back there is in the back of the house where the so-called 3 30 a.m surveillance was taken i'm just wondering whoever did this and i think i personally think christopher and katie are in, involved all the way up to their eyeballs took sebastian out of the house and took him across the street to this like area here and then put sebastian maybe in a vehicle and then took him somewhere but it's like where because i don't think sebastian is anywhere in that Hendersonville area. I think he's somewhere personally between um, Hendersonville and Nashville. I think he's somewhere um, in between. And some people suggested, and I'm going to show you a comment, that he could be in a place called Jackson or Jackson, um, Tennessee. Because Jackson, Tennessee, I'm going to show you. Jackson, Tennessee is on the way to Memphis on the way to Memphis. And they say a lot of people, you know, between that route would stop in Jackson to get gas. There's also a river near there. There's also a river in that area. And, you know, I'm told that he could be, you know, disposed of. And it's sad. It's sad. And we, we are speculating, but the father hasn't set the record straight. The father is being tight lipped. He's worried about how people think about him on the internet. No, you should be out there looking for Sebastian and you don't look, um, you don't do that. This is what somebody said here in a comment, right? About what's going on. They said, uh, Jackson about to get gas, but Ellie has been heavily search, search, searching and circling around the Jackson X exit with THP helicopters and planes for over a week. So is he around there? Do they suspect now, we're talking about two people. Do they suspect that Christopher, or, you know, I'm thinking Christopher. I mean, you know, who, if they're searching Jackson and that's in between Memphis and uh, Hendersonville, that it, the common thing would say, you know, Christopher. I mean, I think the guy's smart enough to leave his phone behind and try to, you know what I mean? Because in this case, you got to think in a law enforcement aspect, you know, you know, 
uh, Sebastian's father is a, works law enforcement. I'm, I'm sure Christopher knows how law enforcement works. I gotta, you know, leave a phone behind or leave it. Deception here. Leave a phone here so now my phone pings at one location and then I can go and do maybe add an extra burner phone. I don't know, and an additional phone. Maybe add a work phone. Maybe the work cell phone. Some people speculated that he actually took a work truck or, you know, how many other trucks or, or vehicles do, do they have access to um, at that job site, at that job site that he worked at, that he sleeps in his camper, that he sleeps in his camper. Nobody can sit there and definitively say, hey, Christopher was here. Christopher was here. You know? It's, it's wild. I'm sure LE is making sure the dots connected with Mom, Pa, Proudfoot's phone Sunday night into Monday. Particularly the two and the fourth hours they allegedly talked Sunday night. And then that's the thing about it is, is I personally think there was a conversation on the phone Sunday night. And I think Katie spilled the, the beans of what happened to Sebastian. And then they concocted a plot and Christopher said, I'll be right there. I'll be there. I'll be there. Or this was planned out for a while, you know, either or. But I don't want to really think this was some nefarious thing planned out. But knowing that uh, Seth Rogers was going to get full custody, the biological father was going to get full custody of Sebastian in the, uh, you know, at the end of the school year. Plus Christopher involved with all this uh, craziness about his behavior um, in New Mexico makes me think, yeah, was Sebastian a witness to something? Um, it'd be sad to think if it was that extreme or was it just a just an accident um, that happened in that house that night and Katie who you know worked in the military works brings armor or brings security and uh, does electrical work she you know called Christopher and you know they have a pact together and they have a love and bond and he you know his assisted he assisted her he assisted her I mean if if Chris went across that line you know that's you know, he's just involved too. Um, because personally, I think, personally, I think that um, in this case, my opinion is Katie did something. Um, I, I want to think probably on her own with Sebastian and then Christopher just helped with the, the, the you know, disposing him. You know, I don't think Sebastian's alive. Um, I, you know, you guys can go, you know, you never give up hope and everything like that. I, I don't think Sebastian's alive at all. I mean, there's has been zero actual searches uh, since they said and announced that they were scaling back the search they haven't gone out there like that um again i was showing that explaining that area in jackson that they maybe been circling around and maybe looking a little bit i don't know when that stopped it could have stopped after they said they were scaling back the search um it could be going on now we don't know um i don't i don't think sebastian's alive um, you know i don't think sebastian's alive and um it's going to be interesting um i think the phone evidence for the parents the step parent or you know stepdad and the, and the mother's probably going to be key here and i also think that there might be some sort of uh authorities you know maybe 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 on the interstate there bef between memphis and um hendersonville got license plate readers or something like that and they can kind of cross reference it with the company uh van we're talking about interstate 40. it's interstate 40 between Stafford Court and uh, Memphis. So my personal opinion, if he w if he wasn't in Jackson, like authorities were searching that 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 they said, um, maybe somewhere in between, maybe somewhere in between. But he got that three and a half hours, and it's just interesting because I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering, you know, if that video surveillance is around three thirty, and it takes three and a half hours to get from Memphis to um, uh, Hendersonville. Right. And I'm, I'm sure maybe he kind of booked it. And maybe if, if it, you know, if he did go uh, booked it, maybe, you know, speed limit 75, maybe push to 85. They don't really spool, pull, you, pull you over in the middle of the night anyway on interstates anymore, unless you like really don't go in crazy speed or DUI and are swerving and stuff like that. But if you're going like 90 on interstates nowadays in the middle of the night, rural, you're pretty much not getting pulled over. So say he gets say he gets back in three hours. Right. So it puts it in that kind of, hey, maybe leaving, maybe Christopher, maybe Christopher left at 12 a.m. from the job site, returned home at, you know, got there and, you know, the surveillance all lights or whatever like that. And, and, and Christopher got out and was able to get back to the job maybe by seven. When did, when did Katie, Katie says that she, she discovered, she discovered um, Sebastian missing. And around 6 a.m. But when did she actually make the call to Christopher? When did she actually make the call 
to Christopher. And then here's another thing investigators will be able to see. Uh, you know, was Katie using her phone in the middle of the night? Uh, was Katie, like, around that time on the 25th and the 26th, what was Katie uh, Googling? Was she making Google searches? Uh, did she use the internet? Was she, or was she literally asleep in the middle of the night, like all night long? And investigators will probably be able to determine that. I think some digital evidence um, is hard to escape nowadays. And I, I, I think, you know, because I, you know, according to Nick Barris and the way my sources have told me is no one has been cleared. The, the parents have not been cleared of anything. They haven't been cleared. They haven't been cleared, folks. And no one has been cleared in that case, centered around that case. So who did it? What happened? What happened? But I think, I personally think Christopher, uh, it's only a matter of time. It could be a possibility he's lawyering up already. There's things we don't know about behind the scene. He does respond to comments on people, but he doesn't want to go out there and put his face out there anymore. Um, you know, because people, people get it. And now that we know more information, now we know more facts about this case and, and an understanding of who the profits are, um, you know, he's, he knows people are going to ask these hard questions. Christopher knows people are going to ask these hard questions that, uh, you know, he's going to, they're going to try to stump them up. And, you know, does any of you out there think it's someone else, like somebody bad or, you know, I, you know, I'm sharing what I feel based off the conversations that I had people center around this case. I do have sources around this case. I have sources of people that live near that, that home that are talking to me. I have a lot of people that are giving me insight, you know. Uh, I will say that the Proudfoot's side of the family, there is uh, one person on the side of the family, I'm not going to say the name, who has serious charges against him, um, serious accusations and charges against him. I'm um, not going to throw his name out because he's, I don't see his name connected to this in any way. Do I think Proudfoot's, Proudfoot got other family members involved? Probably not. I think it's solely, uh, basically, you know, Christopher and Katie. Uh, Christopher and Katie, until proven otherwise, until investigators solved on this channel, JLR investigates, our eyes are on Christopher and Katie. Um, if Chris Christopher and Katie have nothing to do with it, God bless. He still has to, uh, you know, be, you know, explain. I'm sure they have to explain what's going on uh, to the court of public opinion because it's not looking good for them. It's not going looking good for them. See, some people think it's the video game. See, come up with your speculations, folks. Share your speculations on what happened in the chat. Um, someone in the family he trusts, possibly. I, I personally think when Sebastian left that house, um, if he left the house, and I, I, you know, I said a couple days ago, he might still be in the house. He might be in the walls, in the attic, in the basement, in a freezer. He might be still in the house somewhere. Um, but if he left that house that night, I don't think he left the house alive. I don't think he was lured out. I don't think those flashlights have uh, uh, maybe Sebastian was over someone's shoulder. I don't think Katie, well, Katie was in the military. I mean, you know, she can probably pick up a, a kid like that. Who knows? But uh, I don't think Sebastian walked out of that house into the 25th, into the 26th, in the middle of the night. I don't think he walked out of the house. Do you? But we are covering this case. We're bringing uh, extensive, uh, you know, any any newest developments or anything latest, Um. You know, we'll, I'll, I'll just say, I'll just say that the community, and I'm just reading some of my notes here. I, I never reveal my sources, but most of the community out there, I can say most um, feel like the, the parent, the you know, it's Christopher and the mom know something and they're involved. Um, I don't really see the community and neighborhood even rallying around the proud folks. There was actually somebody that drove by that claims on this channel, they left a comment that they said that the RV was hooked up to the truck and ready to go. Uh, that's interesting too. Uh, made me all automatically think, remember uh, when uh, uh, Gabby Petito was missing in the laundries, uh, they all hooked up their RV and went camping. I'm just wondering if the parent, you know, the stepdad and Katie are ready to get out of Dodge or if they're ready to leave. Escape. I don't want this to turn into a case where it's like the TBI now has two pro high profile cases. Uh, Summer Wells, it's over a thousand mm -hmm. days now since Summer Wells went missing. I hope, I hope this doesn't turn into the TBI having two major cases that they have not solved in this case, um, you know, in that state. So I, I, I hope that they, I think this one will get a quicker resolution quicker 
And I think in a matter of days, if not today, we're going to hear some information about parents, either step parents luring up or police interrogating or some more warrants. Warrants. I also heard they had searched an additional landfill. I don't know much details about that, but the landfill, as we were told from the beginning, it was kind of like to rule things out. So, you know, it's going to be interesting this week, I say. Um, law enforcement, but the weekend happened, you know, weekend's about to happen too. So, you know, will law enforcement work around the clock? Sometimes they take off on weekends. I'm JLR Investigates. Good morning. What's your thoughts on Sebastian Rogers, 15 years old, autism? I am in New Mexico. Um, got some information. And, you know, I was I was going to say I was going to release some of the court documents um, with Christopher, with his case out there in um, New Mexico. But I'm not so sure because it, it puts a lot about the ex and stuff like that. And I, the ex... Definitely, they all want to be private people. They don't. They don't. They don't want their faces out in the spotlight. And this might draw their faces into into it. Um, I think it will, ultimately, because I think it paints a picture about Crow, uh, Proudfoot, Christopher Proudfoot, and who he is as a person. The guy had multiple marriages, failed marriages, man, and he was poof, he was aggressive, man, towards these people. Very verbal, very demanding. Uh, you know, very like he wanted a disciplined household. And things like unrealistic things to happen in, in, in his household. He wanted to be the boss, like the commander, the leader in the house. And he was like telling everyone what to do in the house. Oh, that's what I'm told. Um, it's probably why these other marriages failed, you know, because nobody wants to be bullied and nobody wants to be told what to do. And nobody wants to be like, I don't know, like a female submissive 24-7 to the man. It's kind of like that. That's kind of like the household that he wants in his house. Um, he actually kind of shared that on on uh, in reference to said I don't let Sebastian listen listen to the hip hop. Remember he said that I don't let Sebastian listen to the hip hop, and uh, you know, I mean these things. I'm just wondering if you know Sebastian was kind of like in the way between him and Katie, or maybe you know maybe the way the stepfather was treating Sebastian and Katie intervene and something happened something got messy yeah Tab uh, tabitha says a control freak i think he has the control freak mentality did i show you he um his military picture he was in the military he's in the military um so was katie katie lived in uh escambia florida she went under uh, uh katie lynn Payne. that was her previous name where is this guy's pick right here see he was in the military he's in the middle like full metal jacket talking full metal jacket folks yes so what does he know what does he know and you know is he cooperating with authorities or not maybe the authorities should come out and just say hey the parents are not suspects if they're not suspects to kind of you know clear the air maybe they should share more information because at the end of the day if there's foul play involved you would think that authorities would have an obligation to tell the community of Hendersonville that there is a K-I-L-L-E-R on the loose. There's someone bad out there doing something and the community you know, needs to know should the community be worried or not because if this is foul play and the parents are involved, then you have someone out there out there doing some sort of foul play in the community. And don't you think that would be, you know, the community should know that, that someone could be out there? Don't you think of, Law enforcement, if the parents aren't involved and foul play is involved, don't you think law enforcement has a obligation to tell the public to stay vigilant, lock their doors? Uh, you know, there's, we're talking about a child. We're talking about a 15-year-old child. And when a 15-year-old child and something bad happens, a lot of people around there have children too. A lot of people around there, you know, have their own families and you should be worried. So I think law enforcement needs to come and set the record straight. We're not going away with this. The internet stays forever, and uh, the internet's very powerful for getting the message out and actually putting pressure on law enforcement to, uh, you know, do something. Because the community wants to know, right? We've been on so long, my coffee also uh, got cold. Look, Wyndham. I'm staying at a Wyndham. So I'm going to be all, all day in New Mexico, working my way back to Florida in the next day or two. So I'll be in Florida in a couple days. Um, we'll talk about, um, Madeline Soto, got some new information about Madeline Soto and Stearns and Jen Soto. So I'll do another segment later on today. 
uh, praying for the tornado victims up there, man. There were some wild storms. I was going to do some tornado footage this morning. I'm um, show you some of the damage up there. I mean, it's bad up there, man. Indiana. I have some friends in Indiana that were showing on Facebook, and that lightning was like. <sighs> but the storm is coming for the Proudfoots. The storm is coming for the Proudfoots, and I think it's just a matter of time, folks. And we will see. We will sit back popcorn ready and also accountability ready. And, you know, we will share whatever breaks with this case in the meantime. All right. In the meantime, stick to the channel, JLR Investigates. Have a great day, everyone. Be safe. And then we will talk soon when more develops. Bye. Have a good day, everyone. Peace out. Justice for Sebastian, for sure.